Okay, well, I think this is all it's going to show up today. It's getting kind of sparse around here. Must be the end of the quarter. <clears throat> okay, so um, just quick announcements just for the special folks who made it in class today. Um, a reminder that project papers are due uh, this Friday at 4 o'clock, right? Um, they have to be turned in both to the Turn It In uh, website on TED, um, but also uh, I'd like a hard copy uh, in my, just in the box outside my uh, office um, so that I can actually grade them uh, over the weekend. Um, and then uh, the project presentations, those are going to be happening all of week 10, so next week. And so I'd like to have those to me by email. Uh, no later than Monday, June 1st. That's for everyone, no matter what order you'll be presenting in, which will be decided through or pseudo randomly, probably fully randomly, but we'll see how I get my random generator going. Um, so presentations seem to be with June 1st. Now, if you have a, a product, like something that's like digital, um, that you can submit that way, I'd like to have those also by Monday. If you're building something that is actually a physical structure of some kind, um, you can bring that in during your presentation. Um, but I would like to see a photograph of it uh, turned in with the with the project presentation as well. I mean, obviously, if you have a presentation, you should probably like have some evidence of what your project is, so that that sort of all hangs together. Okay, uh, and keep in mind these are uh, five minute presentations that we're going to be running through um, uh, through the lecture periods uh, in, in week ten. Right, so five minutes plus a couple minutes for questions. Which I think should cover all. Of that. Yes. So everyone has to do a presentation, right? Not just the people who decide to do the presentation as a creative funded. So in the creative project, you know, the the you know, there's a balance between the presentation and the creative element, right? So if you put a lot of effort in the creative element, your presentation is really here's what I made, here's how I made it, here's the process of it. It doesn't have to be a very formal presentation. Um, if you're just doing a presentation, then it should be a formal presentation with slides and references and all this other right, stuff. So if you're doing a product, then your presentation talks about... Yeah, basically the process. Okay. You know, how did you decide to make this poem or write this story? Like, what were your, you know, inputs for that? Okay. And then, um, Reason uh, I want these in by Friday because I'm going to read those over the course of week 10 and turn them back to you at the end of week 10. That'll give you a chance to do edits and revisions on those project papers by Tuesday of our final, uh, our finals week, which is the same time as the final exam. So this is totally optional, but if you, if you look over the edits that I have for your papers and you want to turn them back in, you can get back at the half the points uh, that you missed on the project. So obviously, to get like a 95, this is probably not something that you want to spend a lot of time on devote your resources elsewhere, all right? But if you got a lower score, then that might be a good way of sort of bringing that score up, is to take take the edits, right? Now, again, the reason this is based on missed points is that this first copy really should still be a final paper, right? If you turn something that's very, very low quality, it's going to get a very low score either way, edited or not. So keep that in mind that this, these papers, even on the Friday deadline, is still a final project paper. Is it, uh, yeah, sorry, good. Is no. there going to be like a separate or so yeah, I'll probably just make a separate revision, turn it in. Thing. It's just easy. Um, one more comment I'll have since um, most of you, when you turn in proposals, only like I think one or two of you actually use the Chicago style for the references. Make sure you use those for the final project paper. If you have any questions about that, that's there's a uh, there's a, a slide that we made for the workshop uh, that's in the project uh, folder on TED. Okay. We're using Chicago style. For your references. Questions? Yes, ma'am. Um, so there was a question about so you know the remember that there was a you, you can either do like a like a like a creative project like you know poem create something something like that or you can do a formal presentation. Okay. But even during our class, for those of who've done the creative <coughs> projects, should also be presenting some description of what their project is. So. You know, that, that doesn't have to be like a slideshow that's 10 slides long. It could just be standing up here and saying, here's my sculpture of the aliens from Venus, and here's how I decided to make the design choices I made. Okay. So do we bring that product in on the day we present or on Monday? So if you have a physical product, you should bring it in for your presentation. If you have a digital project, so you oh. made like a poem or a, a picture or okay. even a movie, that should be upload, That should be sent to me on Monday. Okay. Monday of 10th. 
Yes, sir. Uh, some of the pictures of the presentation might have. Uh, do you want to show us find the primary source? You know, just maybe even more, um, like, like through like other places, but like kind of like presenting a little better. There's usually not fantastic artwork in primary sources. So if you have a like a nice illustrative picture you're drawing from somewhere else, that's fine to use the presentation. Just make sure you cite where it comes from. Um, you know, the, the bulk of the science you talk about should come from the primary sources, but the pretty pictures very rarely come from primary sources. Also, Occasionally they do. Also, do we have to cite, uh, like, like uh, is this a textbook? Um, you can, you, if, if you're drawing pictures from the textbook, that's fine. If it's, uh, so, you know, much of the textbook is already re-circulated material. Um, so I would prefer if you could find the original source, but often that's not cited in the textbook. So um, I would say as a default, I would cite the textbook. Again, any, anytime you have an idea that's not your own, and generally you should be citing the source for that. The problem with textbooks is that they're actually not the textbook's ideas either. And they often don't actually put in the references except sort of deeply buried somewhere else. So do your best to find the original source. If you can't, I would say, you know, this is from the textbook. Any other questions about the projects? Okay. Um, so there's a, a so there, extra, there have been extra credit assignments, and this is Jacqueline, this is in response to your question on, the, on TED. Um, if you happen to catch Woman in the Moon last week, there is now a place assignment where you can actually write your uh, extra credit assignment. Um, you have to have gone to the event to actually write the assignment for this, and of course it was very limited. How did you get in, by the way? I couldn't even get in. Oh, I didn't go. Oh, you didn't go, okay. Okay, never mind. Um, all right, so then there's two more events coming up, two more movie events coming up. One is uh, this movie called Sleep Dealer that's being shown on Wednesday. As far as I know, these tickets are also, you're also they're also on wait list now, but um, I know that for the Women in the Moon, some people were getting in at the last minute because people just don't show up. They reserve a ticket and they don't show up. It doesn't cost anything, it's free events, but um, if you want to catch that, there's an assignment, extra credit assignment on tag for that as well. The one you can have no problem going if you'd like to, and I really encourage is that we have our screening of the movie Contact. Uh, this is a movie by, uh, based on a book by Carl Sagan, sorry, Jodie Foster, it was back in the 1990s. It's basically what this entire course is about, uh, is sort of contact for life. So uh, we're going to be screening that on Friday, this Friday from 6 to 8 p.m. This is the Canyon 109. Um, so all three of these things, if you catch any of these, these are at, uh, possible extra credit assignments. Yes, ma'am. Um, I already watched Steve Dillard for other classes. Is that okay? Is it, am I supposed to go for the- What class did you watch Sleep Dealer for? For Dimension of Culture. Nice. Um, okay, I'll give you credit for it. Yeah, we gotta write the assignment. Yeah. Okay. Um, where do we get tickets for these things? Um, so Sleep Dealer, right now you can't, the tickets, the tickets, because they're, you know, pay for them. They're just sort of reserved seats. They're all sold out. So the only way I would say is to show up at Atkinson Hall at six o'clock and Plead your case as a student that you know is in dire need of education, and uh, contact not have a reserved seating. So there's a link, but if you go to that page, it just says you know waitlist only, so you can't actually like get any seats. For contact as well. Oh, for contact is just we're just doing this in a lecture hall, so there's, okay. there's no tickets for that. You just show up to the lecture hall. Now oh, I should okay. say to prove that you were there, you should take a selfie. And I think that's in the instructions for the assignment. Take a selfie of yourself in the lecture hall, all right? Um, but that's that's just an lecture. You don't. This is just like the movie we had the third uh, the close encounters third kind. It was just in a room, right? Same thing. No tickets for this one. But all of these events are because of the other class I'm teaching, the Cat Three class, which is a, is about life in the universe as well. So uh, usually we don't have these kind of extra events, but we're happy to have them because of the other much bigger class on this on this topic. Yeah. The questions are already on for those. Yes. Assignments? Okay. Yeah. All three of the assignments are now on TED. Okay. Any other questions? All right. And the last thing I'll point to is that um, that class that has all these events, they're starting to show their projects. So if you want to sort of get some last minute ideas of things that you could do, which is very last minute at this point, they're going to be starting to show some of their projects uh, starting today and Thursday, two o'clock over in the uh, the Six College sort of covered area by the parking lot over there. So if you're just curious, there's no extra credit for that. Just want to show up if you can. Okay, questions? 
Okie dokie. All right, let's do a quick review since it seems like it's been forever since we had class, which is only last Thursday. Um, all right, transit and radial velocity techniques. We talked about the different techniques to identify an extra lower planets. When we combine transit and radial velocity, this allows us to determine what aspects of exoplanets, what characters of exoplanets. We should use six. Their size. Their size, yeah, that's from the transit. So orbital properties, so distance from the star. Density, because you get size, and what else? Mass. Mass, yeah, that's four. The other one's maybe a little more tricky. You know the density, what else do you know about the planet, roughly? Internal composition, good. Where is the radius? Oh, okay. Whether it based on whether it's in the habitable zone or not. Whether it so that really comes from the orbital properties. So I'll count that as 3B. Three, three <laughs> Remember when we have transits, and so when you have transits in general, it means the, star, the planet is passing in front of the star. What else can it do on the other side of its orbit? passes in front of the star at one part of its orbit, it does what on the other side of its orbit? Passes behind the star on the other side of orbit. Geometry. What happens, what, what can you measure with that? Do we see anything when that happens? What about the light? So interesting idea because we do see some cases where there is uh, some gravitational lensing, but that's uh, mostly in the case where you have distant stars and planets passing from that way. Although we have seen this in some planets orbiting white dwarfs, for example, but that's not what I'm looking for, actually. It's, it's emitting spectrum. Which emitting spectrum? Infrared. No, no, which, which, the which? Planets. The planet, yeah, yeah. So when it passes behind the star, the star blocks the planet, which means it blocks the planet's light and it's infrared light it's thermal emission right planets have a temperature they have some kind of emission they go behind the star the star blocks that emission so you see what's called the secondary transit you see a thermal emission okay that's six there's actually many more of these things so we got mass and size internal composition the thermal emission you can also note the composition of the atmosphere the light that passes through the atmosphere when the planet goes in front of the star that is absorbed at certain wavelengths by the materials that are in the atmosphere. So we say something about the atmosphere. And one thing we didn't talk about too much was you can actually map the alignment of the planet's orbit and the rotation of the star. It's something called the rossner mclaughlin effect. And it's important to note this because what's one of the patterns that we see in our solar system? What's the, you know, between the alignment of the sun's rotation and the planet's orbit? What do we see about those? Are they aligned or are they anti-aligned? Are they random? What's that? Perfectly aligned? So is the sun alignment and the orbit, planet orbit alignment are a little misaligned? <laughs> Are you thinking so because I asked the question? Yes. Is it a few degrees off? Uh, it's actually exactly spot on. It's exactly spot on. So there are some, our planet, for example, its rotation axis is a little bit off, right? And Venus is flipped upside down, and Uranus is on its side. So the planet's rotation axes are a little bit off. But the sun and the planets in the solar system are all going around the same direction in almost exactly the same axis, right? That's one of those really key patterns of the solar system that allows us to infer that the planets formed on a disk that was rotating with the sun, right? It's made out of the same material. It started rotating the same way. Everything's rotating together, right? So that alignment is almost perfect in the solar system. But in fact, in other star systems, it turns out that's not the case. And in particular, systems where you have these really hot Jupiters, they're not always aligned exactly the same way. So that suggests that there's something more dynamic going on there. <coughs> OK, uh, first planets found were around, found around what kind of stars, the very first planets? So 
So sun-like stars, okay. Yeah, because um, the first planets that we found were the ones in the solar system. Oh, that's, all right, I'll give you that one. <laughs> all right, the next planet's after that. Outside, our first planet's outside our solar system, good catch. Pulsar. What kind, what's a star, what's a pulsar? Um, after the star. Dies after it dies. <laughs> okay. There's a concentration of energy, I think. There's a second order. Well, there's a concentration of mass. Do you have an idea? There's a rapidly rotating. Mm -hmm. uh, I guess it's a former star. It sends out, like when it rotates, it sends out the end of uh, some type of uh, radiation. We usually detect radio radiation. Text actually emits lots of different kinds of radiation. But what's important about those radio like beams? It rotates at the same speed, so you can tell like the, the, um, the period is constant. Mm -hmm. so. and, and so why would that be important for finding planets? Because um, that is the answer to pulsars. Make sure it's clear. <clears throat> well, so 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 it's a remnant of a dead star, all right, very massive, very concentrated. It spins extremely fast, many, in some cases, thousands of times per second. This is something the size of, again, sort of Manhattan, it's spinning around thousands of times per second. That's an incredible amount of rotation. And we see these beams coming with perfect regularity, except in some cases where there's planets orbiting those pulsars. And because the planet gets pulled back and forth just a little bit, those pulses come at slightly irregular times. And we can actually measure that irregularity really accurately. And we can infer the indirect first planets were found around these very odd types of dead stars, which you know we know of maybe a couple thousand of those in the galaxy. But they're found because of this indirect method of finding their pulses at different times. Now, are these good planets for life? Terrible planets for life. Even though they're actually small and Earth-like size, they're probably not in the environments where we want to find them. All right, so first type of planets outside our solar system. Found by the radio velocity method were what kind of planets? Specific kind of gas giants. Well, yeah, okay, so same, but specific type of Jovian gas giant planets. What was unique about them? Jupiter. Yeah, they're hot Jupiters, all right? These very close in gas giants which we don't have in our solar system, right? And it, and in fact, violates our sort of picture of how our solar system formed. So why did this radio velocity technique find these hot Jupiters first? And find lots of them, actually. Because it favors large and large planets that are close to their stars. Yeah, I think this technique, the radio velocity technique, favors finding, again, this is an indirect method of finding the planet. It met, finds it by the sort of yank it gives on the star. You've got a big planet very close to the star. That's going to give the biggest pull, the biggest yank on the star. And so this is biased toward finding these planets, which up until 1995 we didn't think would exist. Right. So this is a sort of this is this example of selection bias. Um, transit technique, by the way, also has a selection bias finding close stars, close planets to stars, because they have to actually align with the star along our line of sight. Right. So both of those are selection biases. The transit method can also find smaller planets. Oops, oh, you did away. Okay, hot tubers are like the outcome of what two possible processes? Those who didn't have like subliminal vision. How did those hot tubers get there? We don't have them in our solar system. How do they get there? Migration. Good. <laughs> migration. What does that mean, migration? Um, it starts on the outer parts and then it Solar system. Yep, exactly. So do you remember how that might occur? Like what's actually causing that migration? Mm -hmm. it's it's gravitational field and it goes around. Well, the sun's pulling all, all the planets all around all the time. So why did these guys fall in and other ones did not? Yeah. Um, another star kind of approached it and then hugged on the well, I think you're starting to get to the second reason that hot dupers might come in. 
So that's, again, that's kind of the second possibility, which is scattering, right? Scattering is possible. So if you have another star or another planet even in the solar system that gravitationally interacts with the planet that might scatter it in or out, and that might be how you get hot papers. But how does this migration occur? It actually doesn't need to have another star or planet to do that. What has to be there? You may remember from the simulations. I remember there were like this, like this big swirl, and, and the, I think it was in the middle of the stars. I guess the star, the maximum star, and then it, it starts like really slow, but then it comes really fast. So the swirl isn't in the star, but it's in the stuff around the star. It's the circumstellar disk, right? So the stuff that our planets are presumably made out of, that's the theory we have, and we see these circumstellar disks of gas and dust around other young stars. The interaction of that disk with the planet allows the star to fall in. It's like a big drag, right? It's like, a, you know, it's like trying to throw stuff through water and it slows down. So if you have a planet that's trying to go around the sun and there's all this material in the way, um, and that's a very sort of rough analogy, that can take away energy and cause the planet to fall in towards, this, towards the star, at least slowly migrating towards the star. So this is something that must happen very early on in the evolution of the solar system because that that disk of material goes away after about 10 million years. So this is something that happens very early, right? Well before you can start to have life, and even possibly terrestrial planets. In fact, this may be wipe out terrestrial planets around some of these systems. Okay. All right. True or false? Most stars probably have planets. Who says true? Who says false? Pessimist. <laughs> uh, so up until probably a few years ago, I would we would not have enough information to really answer this. But we now know that most stars do indeed have planets. Now, they're not all of the ju hot Jupiter kind or even the Earth kind. We'll see there's a mixture of them. But when you add up all the different kinds of planets, the fraction of stars that have planets is actually above 50%. And so that indicates that most stars do indeed planets. And again, that's you know, accounting for the fact that we're missing lots of planets from the RV method and the transit method and all the methods that we can find of planets are missing lots of them just because of the selection of planets. Even with that, it appears that most stars do have planets. And that's a new fact. All right, uh, are most planet systems like the solar system? False. False. So it's, <laughs> I don't know what this means. So <laughs> who says true? Who says false? All right, if I think the false is habit, that's indeed the case. As far as we know today, and again, this picture may change because we're still trying to find other, you know, all the solar systems out there. Uh, most of the planetary systems we're finding are very unlike our solar system. All right? These hot Jupiters are actually pretty rare, so that's not the thing that, that's mostly different. But even the planets that don't necessarily have these really close in hot planets have very different planetary configurations than we do in our solar system. And that's you know something that's interesting when we start talking about the possibility of life out in the universe. If it's if there's not a lot of places that have Earth-like planets, then we may have problems. All right, last question: Earth mass planets in habitable zones have been found. True or false? Who says true? Who says false? And on and on. All right. Up until last year, the answer to this question was false. So this is all of these very sort of new discoveries. This, this has only recently happened just in the last year or so. And again, I mentioned that, in fact, the person who discovered this first example is, is a former UCSD student, so uh, go UCSD. Um, but you know, this is, again, kind of how new this field is. We're starting to find for the first time the exact equivalence of our planet out in the solar system. Now, is it exactly like Earth? We don't know, because we don't know what the surface conditions are. We don't know what the atmospheric conditions are. There's all these things about the planet we don't know. Venus is a very Earth-like planet near the habitable zone, and it's definitely not a place that we're going to look for life. So there's lots of things to consider here. Yes? Is there a difference between Earth mass and Earth-like? Yes. Venus is an Earth-mass planet that is distinctly not Earth-like. So Earth-like, um, it's a very big, I'll admit it's a very qualitative vague term. But I would think of Earth-like as some place that has water on the surface, um, you know, that has a relatively thin atmosphere so that, you know, you're not under tons and tons of pressure, but some atmosphere so you actually do have an atmosphere. So, you know, somewhere that's kind of like the Goldilocks kind of place where life can form, I would say that's Earth like. But yeah, it's kind of a quality of terms. 
That's why I use Earth Mass. Okay. Any questions on these? Yes, sir. Um, going back to the pulsar thing. Yeah. Uh, in a previous class, did you say they've only found four planets? <laughs> so there are four that are definitely confirmed. There's right. like maybe seven or eight, if you include sort of some candidate uh, planets. I mean, if you remember, the planets that are around, uh, at least the ones that are confirmed, are very low mass. There's, you know, one's like a Mars mass, one's a Mercury mass, and one's like a tiny little rock. Um, and that's only detectable because we can measure those pulses so accurately. That we see very tiny perturbations. Um, so there's a few more that are probably small planets, but because they've only just been found, they need to be verified. Because uh, I remember reading about it, and they said they found three. Around, so there's around three around one star. In fact, there's maybe a fourth one. Yeah. That's so a the four confirmed ones are when they first discovered. No, the fourth one is still a candidate. Or, okay. So there's three around that first one, B1257, and then there's a second one that has a planet, and there's like two or three more pulsars that seem to have pulsar pulse variations. That may so uh, the technique isn't very popular. Then, right? It's not very efficient, no. It's so, in 1992, I think. Yeah. 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 So they found like for yeah. 20 years, whereas you know, the transit method is found now thousands, and, and from Kepler alone, just in, that's just in the last few years. So, so you know, every you know, it's good to have multiple techniques because you find different kinds of planets for different techniques, and every technique has its own biases. So it's important to look at different parameters. You're exploring parameter space with your homework assignment, um, but some techniques are just not very fruitful, but they still find interesting. Okay, any other questions? Okay, so um, today we're going to be, so we talk all sorts about the different kinds of worlds that are out there. Uh, and now we're gonna get kind of the nitty gritty this week is, now that we have all this information about what our solar system is like, what life is on the earth, what, our, you know, what kind of plants are in our solar system, what kind of plants there are out in the universe, you know, is there a possibility of finding life out there? What is the likelihood that we will someday actually see that there's life off this planet? Um, and, you know, this is based on all the sort of facts that we've been talking about. So, again, this sort of very recent result just last year of finding habitable worlds. We know that habitable worlds exist outside of our solar system. So we know that there's at least a possibility of finding life uh, beyond uh, Earth and beyond our solar system. We know that at least in one case, life is very abundant on a planet, and that's here on Earth. It's been abundant on this planet for about three billion years, three and a half billion years. Uh, started very early on in Earth's history. So it seems like if you got the right conditions, maybe life can take hold pretty quickly. And then, you know, the other thing is, is we think about not just basic forms of life, but forms of life that we might actually talk to, right? Uh, we know that intelligent life exists on this one place of a sort, all right? Depends on your definition of intelligence. Um, but we know that there's a technologically advanced civilization on at least one planet. So the question is, are there other technologically advanced civilizations out there? And how would we actually quantify how many of those might be, and how would we actually find them? So um, it's, again, important to go back to this idea of habitability, right? What kind of worlds really are places where we'd expect to find life in the first place? Um, and so you know, we mostly talk about habitable zone as a place where you have liquid water on the surface. And this defines the habitable zone around the star. Uh, it's important to note that that habitable zone, of course, depends on what type of star you have. And you explore this in homework six. And if you have a massive star that habitable zone moves out, if you have a low mass star that habitable zone moves in, that's all dependent on the temperature of the star itself. And so if we were to plot that uh, sort of uh, different types of stars, so the sun's up there, and you get the cooler and cooler stars down here, and then the distance from the sun or the star in which that water can exist uh, on the surface. Uh, you see this kind of band. This is on a log scale, by the way. So up here at 1 AU, you can see the Earth, and then you can see that Mars is also somewhere situated around that same place. Um, and then you see all these other the crosses of different planets around, you know, sort of different mass stars. And you can see that, in fact, there are quite a few little planets that happen to be in this strip of habitability, that strip, again, being exclusively defined by the presence of water on the surface, right? The conditions in which water could exist if you have an atmosphere. Now, of course, this is not the only possibility. We've talked about, you know, that the moons out in the outer solar system where there's, it's way too cold to have liquid water, could have water under the surface. So this is a very restricted definition of, of habitability. 
nonetheless, it's important to note that this is something that uh, depends on the type of star, where those planets have to be, depend on the type of star for them to have water. Now, the problem is you can get a little bit too close. Uh, this is kind of the same plot in, in slightly different scale. This is now uh, mass in units of solar masses. So this is in the sun right here. Here's a tenth of the sun mass. And again, this is distance from the sun in astronomical units. And this is that same habitable zone that I showed in the last plot. Okay, and here's the Earth sitting nice and, nice and happy in it. Um, this line shows the point at which tidal forces between the star and the planet start to force the planet into alignment uh, facing the same face toward the star. Now we see this today with the moon, right? It's not a coincidence that the moon is rotating at exactly the same rate at which it is orbiting around the earth, which allows us to just see one face of the moon, right? It's just going like this the whole time, rotating and revolving at exactly the same rate. That's not a coincidence. That's tidal forces that have slowed the moon's rotation down and forced it into alignment with the earth. By the way, why aren't we showing the same face to the moon all the time? Why is the moon tidally locked to us, but we're not tidally locked to the moon? The moon doesn't have as much of a gravitational influence on the Earth as we have on the moon. All right, so this, this is a good physics, physics one question. Does the moon exert a smaller or greater or equal gravitational force on the Earth? Who says smaller? Who says the moon exerts a greater force on the Earth? Who says it's equal? Did you all pass my physics 1A class? <laughs> equal. Forces are equal. Equal and opposite. Any two things that are experiencing a force between each other experience the same force. An equal and opposite. That's Newton's third law. But what's different between the moon and the Earth? One of them is a lot more massive. So even though it has the same force, the acceleration or the, at least in this case, torquing that the, uh, the sort of the uh, angular acceleration that the moon and the Earth experience are very different because the Earth is so much more massive. Even though that force is the same, it doesn't turn the Earth as hard as it does turn the moon. So, you know, it's the asymmetry of the moon and Earth mass that has forced the moon to be in this tidal lock position. And similarly, if we're looking at terrestrial planets, those are much smaller than the stars. And so if they get too close to the star, they will also be tidally locked up so that they face the same side toward the star. By the way, same thing happens with the moons around Jupiter. Those moons all face the same side towards Jupiter because of this tidal lock. So it's a very common process in, in, uh, in, in planetary dynamics. Of course, the problem is if you have a planet that is just facing one side towards the sun, then that planet is getting super hot on one side and not hot on the other. So you have these very extreme temperatures and it really restricts the area in which life could actually develop, right? Even though this may sit in the habitable zone, uh, it is going to be way too hot on one side because it's getting sunlight all the time. It's going to be way too cold on the other side. It's actually not going to have surface water, except maybe on a sort of twilight zone in the middle of it, right? Now, by the way, there's a caveat to this. And so there's a sort of, there's two things. So you get extreme heat and cold, but also the rate at which you're rotating becomes exactly the same as the rate in which you orbit around the star, and that could be a very long time, right? We have a strong magnetic field because we spin around once every day. But if we spun around once a year, we probably wouldn't have enough rotational uh, energy to generate the kind of magnetic fields that we see here on Earth that protect us from solar wind, right? Again, Venus is a great example. Very slow rotation rate, zero magnetic field. Right? You need to have rotation to have a strong magnetic and that's one of the things that's important for habitability here on the Earth. So two things really kill you if you're inside this tidal zone. Now, one caveat, uh, this planet right here, anybody know what, what planet this is in the solar system? Mercury. Yes, the closest one to the sun is Mercury. Good. Uh, so, so anybody know about how Mercury rotates compared to how it orbits? Is Mercury tidally locked? Then turn around in the opposite direction. That's Venus. Venus turns around in the opposite direction. What do you know about Mercury?
Tundra release sort of like has a longer it's longer than its orbit. Um, it's actually a little bit shorter than its orbit. It's actually in what's called a rotation orbit resonance. Right? It rotates, I think, something like three times or every two times it revolves around the sun. Um, these kind of resonances are um, not too unusual. They happen in some multi-planet systems that, that we're finding, and also happen in multi-moon systems. Um, up, this wasn't, by the way, this wasn't known until the 1960s. 19, before 1960, most people thought Mercury just faced one side of the sun, just like the moon faces one side of the Earth. It was actually a big surprise to find that Mercury actually has a slightly tweaked of rotation. And the other interesting thing is that Mercury also has one of the largest eccentricities in its orbit among all the planets. And this is probably why it has this sort of asynchronous rotation. So even though it is within this line that says you should be tidally locked, always facing one side toward the sun, you can have some additional dynamic effects that can force you out of that alignment. Now, regardless, Mercury is not a great place to live. Right? It's much too hot. There's not a lot of water. So much, you know, if everything would evaporate. It has evaporated a long time ago. But it does suggest that it may be possible to have slowly rotating planets, but they're still going to have problems with no magnetic fields, and that may still kill the possibility. I yes, ma'am. Question about the habitable zone. Mm -hmm. um, like Earth is kind of like on the verge of it. I mean, it's in like within the habitable zone. Yeah. Um, it, is it possible that habitable zone can be like really open? It, it can be moved away from it, right? Yeah. So we talk about this. What happens? What's going to happen to the sun as it gets older? So you have to well, so at some point it's going to get really big, but what is it going to do sort of in the, you know, what is it doing really slowly right now? It's getting more luminous. It's getting more luminous, it's getting hotter, and that's because it's, you know, it's been running out of, it's, it's using up its hydrogen in its core. So in order to keep those fusion reactions going, it actually burns faster, produces more energy, and it's getting brighter and more luminous over time. This has been happening since the, the sun formed. So this habitable zone, because the sun's getting hotter, has been moving out. And that's why we think Venus early on may have been the right conditions to have water because it was a cooler star and so the habitable zone would have been closer to the sun and Venus would have been right smack in it. Um, so this is going to move out and, and you know we are in sort of a bad place because we're on the inner edge of it. And so we're on the edge that's starting to move out or it's been moving out the whole time. So time is an important thing too. How long you actually spend the habitable zone depends on how wide the habitable zone is and you know, how long it takes your star to evolve. So we, we're probably going to be out of the habitable zone in about a billion years. So have fun now. <laughs> all right, so that's all to do with just that, you know, location where water can exist on the planet. Um, lifetime is an important fact. One of the things we haven't, we haven't had a chance to talk about stars in great detail, but we, you know, stars have different life cycles depending on their masses, more massive stars burn up their hydrogen much more quickly and so they have shorter lifetimes on the main sequence and so if you actually plot the time that stars are burning hydrogen that's what we call the stellar lifetime when we say stars die it means they've burned through all their hydrogen and they're either going through sort of various phases of sort of burning other stuff and exploding and stuff like that but we can identify a sort of time scale as a function of mass and again here's the sun which has a lifetime of about 10 million years right and here are the different time scales from when uh, sort of important time scales for life on Earth. Right about uh, 10 million years after the Sun formed is when the Earth formed, so you need at least that much time for to match and make planets in the first place. Uh, microscopic life, we think, started maybe somewhere uh, around of several uh, hundred millions of years, maybe five or six hundred million years, actually pretty quick. You know, considering we've been around for four and a half billion years, but you know, it's still a long time period. And then, of course, complex life. Uh, this is that um, uh, the Cambrian explosion when life starts to uh, colonize land. And you see trilobites and you start to see complicated animals. That really doesn't happen until something like uh, four billion years into the sun's history, right? In the last five hundred million years. But if you have a star that doesn't live longer than say a hundred million years, you don't get to these points, right? Now, it may not be that this is the time scale that's universal, right? Again, we have one example. It's the only thing we have to go on. So maybe some of these stars' life can form much more quickly, and they can evolve much more quickly and conform to complex life much more quickly. We don't know. We have one example of this. 
But if any life is like life on Earth, you're going to have to have at least, you know, something like four billion years in order to get to the point where you have complex life that's actually residing on it. All right. So that sets actually a range of masses, or at least uh, maximum masses, around which, you know, stars around which we would have expect to find life. And that maximum mass, if you want just life, is going to be less than three times the mass of the sun. If you want complex life, it's only, it's got to be less massive than about 40% more than the mass of the sun. Just, you know, if you think about it, wow, we just snuck in, right? We're one solar mass and sort of the limit for complex life, at least if it's like Earth, is only 1.4 solar masses. So we would expect to find a lot more life around lower mass stars because they live longer. Um, another possibility is, you know, one reason that these massive stars are bad as well is that they're very hot and they have higher uh, energy radiation, right? Their black body spectrum is more towards shorter wavelength light. So there's more UV and X-ray radiation. And at least, again, life here on Earth does not do very well in the exposure to high energy radiation. The energy from ultraviolet X-ray light is the same amount of energy as the bonds that bond carbon, carbon together and carbon hydrogen together, same kind of energy. So when you bathe an organic molecule in ultraviolet light, you break that molecule up, right? The light forms actually breaks up the chemical bonds, which is great for, you know, sanitizing things, right? That's why we use UV radiation to sanitize, you know, meats and stuff like that. But sanitizing is not good generally for the development of life. So if you have an environment where you have very high energy radiation, you're unlikely to have the same kind of chemistry that we have here on Earth, which is based on carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. So that's that's a problem. Um, stars are also found in multiples, and it's often difficult to have stable planetary systems when you have multiple stars. We have seen examples, again, very recently, of planets that are orbiting multiple stars. In some cases, they orbit around both stars. This is like a Tatooine-type planet, right? Uh, more often, we see a planet orbiting one star and there's two stars in the system orbiting around each other, right? So that's a, also a stable system. But if you have a case like this, where you've got two stars and a planet that form somewhere in the middle, this sort of three object dance is very unstable. It very quickly falls apart, and usually it's a planet getting kicked out somewhere else, right? But this may be the source of these sort of wandering planets that we think may exist and are starting to find some evidence of, right? Maybe they they form these sort of uh, unstable hierarchical or unstable triple systems or quadruple systems, right? But if that's the case, they're not going to be stuck in the habitable zone very long because they're going to go shooting down into deep space, and that's that's kind of it for, for habitability. Right? So whether you're orbiting a single or multiple star is something that's really important as well. And importantly, most stars in the galaxy are in multiple systems, so this starts to restrict the number of places where you expect to have planets. Um, the last point is that uh, you know, the other elements of life that we need are these special uh, special elements, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, and sulfur, right? 98% of the elements that make up life. And we've seen why those elements are so important in life. But it turns out that the distribution of those elements is not uniform throughout the galaxy. Um, there's something that's known as the galactic habitable zone. It's sort of a ring around the, the galaxy where the abundances of elements seem to be just about the same as the abundances of elements in our sun. So if that's the ultimate, you know, the optimal element composition, then we may only find habitable worlds in this section of our galaxy, which actually turns out to be a relatively small part of our galaxy. Our galaxy actually extends way beyond what you see in this visible light image. Of course, this is not a picture of a galaxy because I can't take a picture of a galaxy from the outside. Um, this is just a picture model of it. But it really restricts where in our galaxy we might expect to find habitable worlds just based on the elemental composition. Right? Way out here in the outer skirts, there's very few heavy elements like carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. And way here in the middle, uh, there are plenty of elements, but it's also a very high radiation environment because there's so many stars. So there may be just places in the galaxy where we'd expect to find habitable life and places we don't. That's another consideration. All right. So Taking all this together, we can ask how many habitable worlds are out there. Uh, we know there's something like 200 billion stars in our galaxy. Uh, and if we break down the number of stars by mass, what we find is that there's about 25% of them have masses in this range. Now remember, this lower limit is set by that tidal locking, right? 
lower the mass of the star, the closer the planet has to be. If it gets too close, it's tidally locked. Not a great place. So this sets the lower limit. And this outer limit is the lifetime of the star. Right? If the star dies too quickly, you don't have time for life to evolve. So that sort of only that gets rid of three quarters of the stars in our galaxy that could be possibly a host for life. Um, only about 10% of these are in this galactic habitable zone. Right? That's a small fraction. We now know that uh, at least you know half, maybe a bit more than half, of these type of stars have Earth-like planets, either Earths or super Earth-like planets, and so uh, that you know maybe half don't. So that gets rid of uh, some fraction of those, and then only maybe about ten percent of those planet systems are going to have planets in the habitable zone. This is a bit of a guess because we haven't quite the quite uh, sort of. Uh, figured out exactly the fraction of uh, planets in habitable zones. But if you look in our solar system, we've got one planet out of nine in the habitable zone, or a planet out of eight, right? Depends on what you count. Right? So that's one in ten, roughly, right? give or take. So if you add, you know, multiply all these numbers together, you get down to something like 250 million habitable planets in the galaxy. That's still a huge number. Right? This is still not rare. It seems to be a lot of possible worlds. And of course, depending on how you make these estimates, you can have a range, right? It could be 10 billion, it could be all the way up to 10 billion, right? This sort of shows how unknown these numbers are, this sort of huge range. But it does suggest that there's lots of places where habitable zones might, might habitable worlds might exist. So we should start looking for them, right? How do we go looking for them? Well, it depends a little bit on how we actually want to find, what kind of life we want to find. If we're just looking for simple life forms, right? Little bacteria and microbes, the things that have been around on our planet for you know, billions of years before we started walking around on it, um, we have to start looking for the products that those life uh, forms actually produce. And one of the best ways of doing this is looking at what the atmospheric compositions are. So this is just showing um, uh, <coughs> what the sort of uh, roughly the kind of the how much material uh, we would see sort of coming up off the surface of the planet uh, for different elements. Okay, so you have like stuff like hydrogen, methane, all right, you have some of these things like dimethyl sulfide are only found as life forms. And you can compare, like, you know, how much of this stuff would you expect to find on the planet on something like Earth, and how much would you expect to find on a planet that doesn't have any life forms? And it's a very different molecular composition, right? Our atmosphere is almost entirely uh, uh, sort of generated or at least modified by the life forms that have been on this planet, right? Just thinking about the oxygen in our atmosphere. No other planets in our solar system have oxygen atmosphere. All that oxygen is produced by photosynthesis. So life has had a significant impact on what our atmosphere looks like. And so if we can study the atmospheres, and we know we can do that with transit spectroscopy, then we can actually look for the chemical signatures of life in those atmospheres. So that's one way we can look out for life. Um, here's just another example. This is showing the spectra in the infrared. So this is wavelength in microns. Um, around a few strong molecules, and you can see here's Venus, and here's Mars, and here's the Earth, and all three of these planets have carbon dioxide in their atmospheres. Even though the Earth has a very small fraction, you can still see it in the spectrum because it's a very strongly absorbing molecule. Um, we can see, for example, in Venus, hydrogen sulfide. You don't see that on Earth or, or Mars. What Earth has that Mars and Venus don't have are both water and oxygen, in particular O3, this ozone. Right? Why are these ozone so important, by the way, for life on Earth? Other than being a product of oxygen, why is ozone? Exactly, it does. It exactly blocks UV. So the absorption you're seeing here, this is in the infrared, but if I went over to the UV, which would be over here, you would see another very strong O3 feature. And it's important that that's there, because that absorption is actually absorbing the UV radiation that would damage our cells. So detection of O3, not only does it tell us that, hey, there's a source of oxygen, which really shouldn't be in these planetary atmospheres, but it also indicates that the surface of this planet is probably protected from ultraviolet light, which means that the chemistry that we see in life is also protected. So O3 is one of these signatures that people are looking very hard in the spectrum of planets, because if you see it, that's a really strong indication not only of light, but the conditions that can really allow life to develop and evolve. And again, we're starting to be able to do that now with the technology we have. 
Um, even if you don't look at spectroscopy, you can also just look at the colors of planets, all right? A very, very simple snapshot picture of a planet might tell us something about whether life is on it. Um, this is kind of just an infographic, but it shows the sort of ratio of uh, red to green light here on the bottom axis and blue to green light on the, the vertical axis. And all the planets, you can see that, you know, the gas giants are all over here on this side and the terrestrial planets on this side, but Earth is standing out here all by itself, all right, just based on its color. Now this tells us that it's a very blue and very red looking planet. The blueness, of course, is from the ocean water, right? Where does the red color come from? Anybody know? Or actually, let me take a step back. So go ahead. Say again. Iron. So we do have some places that have iron on the surface, right around volcanoes and things like that, but those aren't huge sections of the planet. Yeah. Yeah, so the continents, so there's some, so part of the iron is in the volcanoes around the continents, but we also have just desert, which is kind of brown, which looks a little red-ish, depending on, you know, What's in the sand? So it turns out that, in fact, a lot of this red light, which is kind of surprising when you think about it, is actually coming from the plants themselves. Right? There's something called the red edge that is uh, the result of photosynthesis absorbing light on the plant. Right? Photosynthetic uh, you know, compounds in plants are very efficient at absorbing red light. And, you know, the fact that plants are very strikingly green a lot is because the red light has actually been absorbed out of them. So has blue light, as it turns out, right? The green light is reflecting. And so the sort of absorption by red light uh, allows Earth to actually have a sort of slight tinge to it that these other planets don't have. And there's folks that also look for this sort of red edge and, again, pictures of planets to see if they can see for evidence of photosynthesis. Now, there's no reason to think that other life forms would develop photosynthesis. That might be something that is just unique to the Earth. But, you know, these are just basic chemicals. And so maybe it's not too crazy to think that that's a pathway that's very common to develop to life. So there's multiple sort of ways that we can maybe approach looking for uh, simple life forms based on their effect on both the atmosphere and also just their sort of coverage of the planet. Um, that we can take pictures of. And we're, again, we're just starting to get to the point where we can start doing this. Now, that's one form of life form, all right? Another form of life form, of course, would be someone we could talk to, and those are the aliens, right? So how, where are all these aliens? This is something that Enrico Fermi, who was a famous physicist uh, back in the early part of the 20th century, um, he's a famous physicist because he's basically the, the father of sort of all of nuclear physics. He developed the first nuclear reactor. He was uh, Key to sort of developing the, the nu first nuclear weapons, and then he was an outspoken critic of nuclear uh, nuclear weapons afterwards. Um, but he also thought about sort of big problems from an estimation point of view, sort of thinking about numbers and saying, uh, how can I estimate something like this? And he did this the calculation we just did before, but how many potentially habitable worlds might there be in the galaxy? And came up with a similarly extremely large number. And and thought about this and said, well, look, you know, the not just the galaxy, but the universe is so big, right? And there seem to be so many habitable worlds, and we know that at least on this habitable world, we have intelligent life forms. And we've only kind of recently gotten into technology, right? So you can imagine if we're around for another couple hundred thousand years, we'd have fairly advanced technology, right? Almost like magic. So there's all these sort of habitable worlds and potential for advanced life forms. There should be advanced life forms all over the place, and they should be super advanced. They should be colonizing the entire galaxy. So where are they? Why don't we see them? So this question just, and so, you know, it's a more scientific way. This hypothesis seems inconsistent with lack of observational evidence to support it. It says, where the heck are the aliens? All right, why don't we see the aliens if this is, you know, it seems likely that you can have life uh, throughout the universe. So this question has been known as Fermi's paradox. And sort of the search for intelligent life is really evolves around this question, right? How do we quantify you know, where, how often does intelligent life arise, and how do we actually look for them, and why don't we see them? Are we missing them, or are they just not there? 
right? These, these are sort of the outstanding questions in this field. So uh, asking the question of how many civilizations might be out there is something that um, uh, this person, Frank Drake, uh, sort of started asking back in the 1960s. Uh, you're going to hear more about Frank on Thursday. Um, Professor Shelley Wright's going to be talking about the SETI project, which I'll make it to just briefly at the end here. Um, but that's the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. This is the effort to actually look for uh, aliens that have intelligent civilizations that are communicating through space and stuff like that. Um, and Frank Drake was one of the early proponents for this idea. And he also thought about this quantitatively. How would you actually go about estimating not just the number of habitable worlds, but the number of intelligent species that might be out uh, in the universe? And he came up with this equation that's written over here. So this is the equation. It looks like a really crazy, uh, silly equation with lots of strange letters. But this is really just kind of a, a way of organizing our ignorance about this question. Right? To ask how many intelligent civilizations out there actually asks a lot of sub-questions that we have to sort of figure out and piece all together. So this is what all these, these different questions are. So we'll go by this one by ten, one. So this first number here is just asking, essentially, how many stars you know, can we look for uh, alien life around? We know that today that's 200 billion stars. But we can also ask this in the sense of how many stars are formed every year. right? Because every year you form some stars, every year there's some civilizations that exist, and that'll give you some idea of the number of civilizations. So this is a number that's known, the average rate of star formation in our galaxy. It's something like 20 stars per year. Right? So that gives us a starting plate for at least places to look for planets. Um, the next question is one, the next factor here, FP, is one that we've just started to get real limits for, and that's a fraction of stars that have planets. And as I said, uh, that fraction seems to be uh, at least the majority. This is a plot I've shown before showing the breakdown of different types of planets and the fraction of stars that have at least one of these types. Uh, and as I mentioned, if you add up all of these different varieties, you get over 50%. So more than 50% of stars have planets. Of course, maybe only a third have the kind of Earth-like planets that we're particularly interested in. But of course, then you also have to count the moons around these Jupiters and ice giants and stuff like that. Who knows how many other worlds there are, right? So at least there seems to be like, you know, 50% of stars have planets, and probably more because many of these stars have multiple planet systems, so multiple chances of finding that's the limit of our real knowledge. After that, we start to get into some unknown numbers. All right? So uh, we may know the number of stars that uh, the number of planets around each of the stars. We don't know how many of those planets can support life. All right? We talked a little bit about this in our scale of the solar system. Here are the sort of inner terrestrial worlds except Mercury, and here are sort of the four of the big moons out in the outer solar system. And we really can only rule out life on one of these, which is Venus. Right? Venus is much too dry and much too hot to have life forms. But we still can't rule out subsurface life on Mars, or on Ganymede, or, or, or Europa over here, or Titan, or Callisto. All of these may have subsurface life, because they may have ocean waters underneath the surface that are being heated by tidal friction, at least down here in the bottom parts. All right. So we actually don't know an answer to this even in our own solar system. So this is an unknown number. What fraction of the planets in a given solar system can have life, or have will for life? You know, it could be all of them, it could be a significant fraction, or it could be one, like the Earth. We don't even know that in the solar system yet. So that's an unknown number. Uh, what fraction of these habitable planets can actually develop life? Again, we only know one for sure, and we don't know about the rest. Right? These are still questions. No idea. It could be this is 100% form life forms, or it could be that one, like the Earth, forms life, even though it's habitable. I don't know that answer, even in solar system. Um, so now we're starting, so this is, you know, so we get to the point where we have life. What fraction of these life brain planets can you actually get intelligent civilizations? And this is where we really get into speculation because, again, we only have one planet, which we know as life, and we know it has intelligent civilizations. But, of course, if it didn't have intelligent civilizations, we wouldn't be asking what fraction of planets have intelligent civilizations because we wouldn't be around. Now, Intel so there's two kind of words here. There's intelligence and there's civilization. Um, intelligence is something that's very qualitative. Right? We have plenty of animals on this planet that are extremely intelligent. They have social behaviors. Uh, they have forms of communication. They use tools. Right? But so, so how do we actually quantify this? It's not just brain size because you know, elephants and whales have humongous brains, but they don't you know, tap at 100 characters a minute. 
on their phones because they don't have phones. All right. So it's not just brain size. People think that, in fact, it's so some fraction of sort of the brain to body mass is a way of estimating intelligence. And of course, it's a way of estimating because we happen to come out on top on that particular number. Um, but you know, there are many species that are very close. So this encephalization quotient, the ratio of body mass to, to sorry, brain size to body mass, um, we're sort of on top of that, but there are other, other creatures that are fairly high. I should say it's not exactly a perfect brain to body mass because it turns out birds have a much higher brain to body mass ratios than we do because their body masses are so light because they fly. But they're also not writing, writing things, although they have some very, very intelligent behaviors. Now, the important thing is that these kind of, this, you know, you can actually estimate this kind of ratio going back into the geological record. We can look at the sort of brain cavities of early humans and of primates. And we have lots of evidence that across the sort of different species on the planet, this encephalization quotient has continuously gotten larger and larger over the course of, uh, of the, the history of life on Earth. So that suggests a positive evolutionary pressure to move towards more intelligent species, at least in the one experiment that we have any measurements for, which is here on Earth. Now, civilization is another thing, right? We can, if you take a humanities class, you can write down all the possible sort of characteristics of civilizations. Uh, obviously, social structure is one, but there's all sorts of different sort of characteristics. This is highlighted because this is for my cat class, so culture, art, technology have to be important aspects of civilization. Um, the amazing, and again, we don't know if this is a natural consequence of intelligent life forms, right? We certainly see animals that have social structure. Uh, we have no idea about religion, although there's certainly uh, many instances of, for example, crows have behavior that suggests mourning of death. You know, they have sort of uh, what look like the sort of funeral rituals. Um, you see crows that, you know, there's a, I have a great video of a crow that's dying on the ground and the crows around them are circulating and calling out. It suggests some kind of, you know, complex social behavior. Now, and they have a fantastic stable food supply in our garbage cans. So maybe this is the rise of civilization, but we don't know about any of other stuff. But the amazing thing about, at least in terms of human beings, civilizations cropped up across the planet, all at roughly the same time, at least within a few thousand years of each other, and in cases where you have essentially no contact between those groups. So uh, the sort of the earliest civilizations we see are here in the sort of Middle East and the sort of uh, uh, Tigris Euphrates valleys. Um, but we also see civilizations popping up out here in China just a few thousand years later. There's probably contact between these groups, but there's certainly no contact between these groups and these groups over here in the Americas. And yet they develop exactly, essentially the same patterns of civilization. In some cases, it's essentially the same patterns of building, right? There's pyramids in Mexico that look a lot like pyramids in, in Egypt. All of these were happening independently. And it suggests that maybe a civilization, an organization of civilization is something that's very common at least when you reach to a certain level of intelligence. Again, completely speculative, because we've got one example, right? human beings. That's it. So we're left to sort of wonder how often this would actually happen in other worlds. All right, so that's unknown. And then uh, you have to go even further than that. You can have an intelligent civilization. You can have a pod of dolphins that's talking to each other. But are they actually a pod of dolphins that you can communicate with out, out in space? And so this next fraction uh, talks about the fraction of civilizations that communicate across space. And that's a fairly recent outcome of our particular species because it requires electromagnetic energy. It requires the intelligence and the tools to harness electromagnetic energy. Um, and you know, it requires electronics, which really kind of rules out dolphins from being a communicating intelligent civilization because it's hard to build electronic radios in seawater right? uh, with flippers. So, this starts to sort of pin down our numbers a little bit more. Now, we have been uh, communicating out in space for about 100 years now. Our first radio broadcast were made in 1906. This is a picture of uh, Marconi uh, with the first sort of radio uh, um, transmission device that he sent a message between the United States and Europe back in 1906 or 1901. So we've been broadcasting for about 100 years. And those broadcasts are just going out into space. They're leaking out into space in all directions which means by now, those broadcasts have reached about 500 sun-like stars. That's how many st sun-like stars we have within 100 light years of our world. So in principle, we have been a communicating civilization for quite some time. 
Even so, 100 light years is a tiny, tiny fraction of the size of the galaxy. Anybody remember how big the galaxy is across in light years? Yeah, of order 100,000, 50,000 light years, all right? So we would have had to be communicating for 100,000 years to actually reach everybody. And we certainly are not doing that. We're a very new communicating species. And nonetheless, there's still plenty of stars in our neighborhood that, you know, if they have sufficient uh, sensitivity, could actually detect those communications. And vice versa, right? If there are worlds nearby that have started their communicating recently, Perhaps when we have enough sensitivity, we could pick up those transmissions as well. And that's the whole purpose of SETI. Is, yeah. But isn't there a limit on like how much they can pick up as like the radio waves weaken over time? They weaken as one over distance squared, right? So, so this is a whole question of you know uh, how advanced does a civilization have to be? We are only starting to detect radio signals in space in the last hundred years. The other civilizations are doing this thousand years this is probably a no-brainer but who knows all very very speculative okay all right and then the last and probably the most important factor in the end here is how long such civilizations last and again this is a speculative question because we have one example of which we don't actually know the outcome for fortunately right so, you know, as a civilization, you know, so, you know, we appeared on the planet as a genus about 2 million years ago. We appear on the planet as a species only about 200,000 years ago. Our first civilizations are within the last few thousand years. We've only been technologically capable to transmit out into space in the last 100 years. And, of course, almost immediately after that, we start building weapons of mass destruction. So a good question is, you know, a, a species that's capable of the technology to travel to the moon, for example, are they also capable of technology to build tools that will also wipe out their civilizations? And we have no idea. Right? We have no idea what that number is. Fortunately, right? we asked this question maybe 20 years ago. People thought it's about like 50 years because we're about to go into their Holocaust. I think we've sort of actually passed that time where that's a major problem. But you know, asteroids hit the planet. There's all sorts of things that that you know we can cook our planet based on carbon dioxide release. There's all sorts of things that can limit the lifetimes of civilizations. And we simply don't know what that number is. So all of these things factored together to give you some estimate of, at least in sort of this framework, some estimate number of civilizations. So you can start plugging in numbers and guesses for these things. And so, uh, for example, if I want to make a guess that you know the number of planets that can support life in a system, let's say there's one, like the Earth, all right? And um, the fraction of that actually developed life, so the Earth is habitable and it developed life, so I'll say that's 100%, right? And maybe only 1% of those kind of planets develop any kind of intelligent civilizations. And only 1% of those actually build the technology to transmit and communicate and travel in space. And those last for 10,000 years, which is a pretty long time, right? We're only 100 years in. 10,000 years is a much longer time. But add, multiply all those numbers together, I get something like 1 in the entire galaxy, one communicating intelligent civilization. And that's assuming we last 10,000 years. So that's kind of distraught, dis disheartening. <laughs> All right. But of course, we don't know what these numbers are. So let's play with them a little bit. Let's say that there's a lot more, you know, the fraction of planets is much higher. It's like three quarters of the stars of the planets. And let's say every one of those stars, they have three, you know, different uh, planets that can form life. Uh, and all of those planets, you know, all, all of those uh, habitable planets actually develop life. That should actually be a one. Um, and, you know, anytime you have life on a planet, it immediately goes to intelligence. And anytime you have intelligence, it immediately goes to transmitting broadcasts. And those things last, you know, those civilizations last for 100,000 years. Then you've got tons and tons of intelligent communities, 13 million. You can see the range of these guesses by how uncertain we are about these completely speculative ideas. Right? It, we could be the only you know, civilization in the entire galaxy today, or we could be one of millions. We simply don't know because we don't know these numbers. Okay, so in the last uh, five minutes, I want you to take a moment and write down your guesses. Make sure you put your name on, ignore the cat free on the top there. Write down your guesses for these numbers and justify them and see how many civilizations you get. 
and we lost. Oops. The numbers can be anything. Okay. But you have to explain why you chose that number. Okay. So the first two I'm going to give you because that's actually something we kind of know. Right? Everything after this is entirely up to you. But but think of a reason why you're choosing that number. And then when you're done, multiply all those numbers together. See what you get.
Uh, I'm gonna, I'll do a poll at this moment. Is anyone still calculating? <laughs> Okay, how many of you get somewhere between, how many, how many get less than one? <laughs> one gets less than one, okay. How many get between one and ten? Ten to a thousand. Okay. Thousands to a million? Okay, how'd you get? Well, um, yeah, right on thousand, okay. All right, I'm counting a thousand. <laughs> All right, more than a million. Okay. All right, so uh, just for, and I don't think that adds up numbers. So yeah, I'm to do it. Get 10, 10 to a thousand. Yeah, 10 to a thousand. So um, the remarkable thing is that in every class I do this in, that's it's. Pretty close to the distribution. Usually, I have more numbers, but that's pretty close to the distribution. That there's there's a lot of sort of optimists, I would say, in terms of number of, of, of habitable worlds out there, uh, and occasionally uh, a few pessimists as well. Um, but the interesting thing is that we, you know these are being, this is uncertainty by orders of orders of magnitude, right? And again, it's because we really don't know. I have a handle on these numbers. Now uh, on Thursday. Uh, as I mentioned, Professor um, Wright is going to be coming in here. She works on the SETI project, and she works on the project that actually seeks to quantify some of these things more, more precisely by looking for intelligent civilizations. Um, and so she'll talk a little bit more about this sort of efforts to do that. Um, Wednesday, uh, so tomorrow we're going to have our uh, discussion section at 4 o'clock. Um, your lab books are in the back. If you want to pick them up and bring them with you Wednesday. Otherwise, I will bring them with me Wednesday instead. Um, but we're going to talk a little bit more about sort of the next step after sort of quantifying is how do we actually go and identify and communicate with civil relations. Any questions? Are you surprised by your numbers? Okay. All right, uh, go ahead and turn in your written forms uh, up towards the front corner here. And I will see y'all on uh, when tomorrow.